surfing your feeds on Instagram, Facebook, Pinterest, or others, the messages of spirituality and in dealing with life's challenges can at times be overwhelming. One name above all others is repeated over and over again, Rumi. Rumi said this, Rumi said that. The quotes are endless, providing wisdoms and knowledge that appear to be from another time and place. A serene, mystical place out of this world. A field, and I'll meet you there. But what is surprising is that the many people who share and consume such snippets of his vast writings have never really appreciated Rumi or his works, and for sure, don't know much about him. And what they critically don't know either is that what they're quoting most of the time is not Rumi at all. Jalaluddin Muhammad Rumi was a Persian Islamic scholar born in 1207 in Belkh in present-day Afghanistan. Rumi would go on to follow in his father's footsteps and himself become a Sufi Muslim theologian and jurist. 21 years later, Rumi would settle in Konya in present-day Turkey while becoming an Islamic teacher and Sharia expert in a leading madrasa for the remainder of his life. In 1244, an uncoincidental encounter with the wandering Darwish Shams at Tabrizi, a Sufi scholar and poet, would propel Rumi into a relationship and journey of enlightenment. With Shems almost 20 years his senior and his spiritual guide, Rumi would discover his true essence of Sufism that was based on the deepest devotions through finding oneness with the divine, while also finding the most powerful version of platonic love for his mentor Shems. Shems would mysteriously disappear in 1248, and with his sudden departure came Rumi's bereavement. Such a yearning and longing for his missing friend would see Rumi's poetry take form, echoing the tremendous and tragic loss through an outpouring of lyrical expressions and poems called the Diwan Shems at Tabrizi, that would subsequently be followed by his masterpiece, the Methnawi Umanawi, a six-volume Persian Muslim spiritual text in poem form that would be regarded as one of the most important and influential in Sufi Islam. When I stated earlier that what was being quoted in today's post-frenzy world wasn't exactly the words of Rumi, I was being very literate. Rumi in today's world is vastly misrepresented, not in only what he wrote though, but also in who he was. You see, the West adores and applauds Rumi, but strictly as the mystical poet and separates his existence entirely from that of being a committed Muslim and religious scholar, whose thoughts, words, and expressions were strictly founded and inspired by the Quran, the Prophet, and Sharia, the Islamic law. To significant parts of the East, on the other hand, and mainly Wahhabist and Salafist Sunni conservative branches of Islam, Rumi is outside of Islam. Rumi is considered a heretic whose Sufi mysticism was an unacceptable path away from the righteous way and orthodoxy of the faith and its Sharia. Rumi is accused of putting himself and his writings along the same levels of the divine, as well as that of the Word of God, the Quran, and such statements were and are considered, till today, a sinful descent. From an observer's perspective, it is greatly intriguing to see how the mysticism of one man attracted so many to his beliefs and words, while the same mysticism drove a powerful, emotional, and excommunicating wedge between him and a large contingent of Muslims. Let's talk about how the West perceives Rumi, and to do that we have to go back to the end of the Victorian age, and the beginnings of colonialist expansions and namely what became known as the Orientalist period. With the introduction of Arab and Muslim culture into Europe and more specifically that of the written word which at the time was mainly either religious discourse or poetry, the West began to uncouple the highly attractive mystical poetry from its Islamic roots. The experts of religion and translation of the time could not reconcile their ideas or themselves about a desert religion with its unusual moral and legal codes. The explanation they settled on was that these people are mystical, not because of Islam, but in spite of it. In the case of Rumi's poetry and writings, intentional mistranslations and omissions began the gradual corruption process in the early 19th century that culminated in the creme de la creme of the rehashing of his works in the late 1970s and onwards by Coleman Barks, the so-called expert of Rumi translations who doesn't speak neither Farsi nor Arabic. Nonetheless, Barks' works saw an explosion of appreciation for Rumi's misquoted words 
and led to Rumi becoming the most read poet in the Western Hemisphere by the early 1990s. Yet how did the West extract the Islam out of Rumi, in splitting the mystical poet from the orthodox scholar? I'm going to list some of Rumi's most famous and well-circulated quotes and how they differ in context and essence from what has been flaunted by the West. Let the beauty we love be what we do. There are hundreds of ways to kneel and kiss the ground. A serene and lovely quote, right? But in Rumi's original, the kneeling and kissing are direct references with their specific Persian terminologies for prostration postures during prayer. Muslim fundamental traditions and their context seem to vanish from the quote. In the poem Like This, the typical Western version reveals, If anyone asks you how the perfect satisfaction of all our sexual wanting will look, lift your face and say, like this. The more correct version, when translated accurately from Farsi, would be, Whoever asks you about the Huris, show your face and say, like this. The westernized version leaves out Huris altogether, the Huris being the virgins promised to Muslim believers in paradise. To give the translator the benefit of the doubt, you'd think the purpose for such an omission was to remove religion from such poetry. But when you continue on within the same westernized version of the poem, references to Jesus and Joseph are retained. In some cases, it gets even worse. The quotes listed by the West are not even by Rumi, yet serve to establish the non-Muslimness of this Muslim thinker. Not Christian or Jew or Muslim, not Hindu, Buddhist, Sufi or Zen, not any religion or cultural system. I'm not from the East or the West, not out of the ocean or up from the ground, not natural or ethereal, not composed of elements at all. First of all, when looking at the quote, the first impression is that Rumi disassociates himself with all religions, and hence, he belongs to none of them. But when analyzing further the Farsi version of this verse, a major omission is discovered. A full sentence that precedes that line has been removed. What can I do, Muslims? I do not know myself. Here, Rumi appears to be asking an existential question. He's not questioning his faith, but his beingness. So it's not about not being a Muslim, but about his reason for being. The biggest fallacy with this quote, though, is that it doesn't exist in any of his texts, neither the Methnawi nor the multiple diwans he wrote. So this often repeated quote doesn't even apply to Rumi whatsoever. There are many more examples of both the diluted versions of Rumi's words as well as those that have been incorrectly attributed to him. The question remains, does the essence of his intentions remain? You would think that when one grows up and attends school in the Middle East, one of the main subjects promoted for learning would be the poetry of Rumi. But in Arab Muslim nations specifically, that is not so. What is taught of Rumi and his like Ibn Arabi and others is that they are all heretics, and for many reasons. You see, the biggest issue held against these scholars or thinkers is their Sufism, and that comes with a lot of baggage. The principles of mysticism, unity of being, metaphysics, and other religious innovation are believed to all fall outside of the belief system of the orthodox Sunni majority. And to complicate things more for Rumi to be accepted, there were more obstacles to his inclusion into the appreciated club of religious thinkers. One major accusation towards Rumi by Sunni Islam was his supposed support for the Mongol invasions that led to the fall of Baghdad and Damascus, and that had an important role in ending the Golden Age of Islam. In his Fihi Mafihi discourses, Rumi states when they, the Mongols, were desperate and weak and had no strength, God helped them and answered their prayer. Now, when they are so powerful and mighty, God is destroying them with the comforts of the feeblest. So they will realize that it was through God's bounty and support that they captured the world and not by their own force and power. Such a statement followed a much wider narrative of observations by Rumi that attempted to explain the successes of the Mongols, especially at the expense of Muslims that at the beginnings, Mongols came from a position of humility, whereas Islam was concentrating on worldly materiality and power. Such a narrative would be a great cause for not only labeling Rumi as a traitor, but in his total excommunication by many a Muslim scholar. Another key assertion against Rumi was his concept of an all-encompassing love within the practice of the Islamic faith. Love was in all of his writings, both in his prose and his ghazals, poems of spiritual and romantic love 
that exude expressions of pain and suffering. For Rumi, love was everywhere in Islam. Orthodox Sunni Islam disagreed vehemently. Rumi's expressions of elation, drunkenness, desires, and sexuality when revealing the extents of love as an overall driver of the faith didn't sit well with conservative Sunni Islam, as they were considered prohibited topics and certainly not subjects that could be mentioned in the same sentences that include Allah, the Prophet, the Quran, and the Sharia. Unfortunately, part of the discourse that further helped demonize Rumi was the assimilation of the original Orientalist convictions by Muslim scholars and thinkers of the 19th and 20th century, representations that portrayed Rumi in a non-Muslim manner, virtually abandoning his faith while legitimizing many prohibitions, and hence these impressions circled back these falsehoods onto the more modern Muslim thought and analysis. Some will say that no one religion or culture has ownership of the written, be it stories, myths, doctrine, or poetry, that they are universal and belong to any and every creed, and could be bastardized to each's satisfaction. In either case, Rumi definitely might have had something to say about both positions. I'll serve the Qur'an evermore. I'm the dirt of Muhammad's door. If one claims I said any more, both him and his words I abhor. This quatrain addresses both the West and East's conflicted positions on Rumi. It couldn't be clearer. Rumi, by self-admonition, was an extremely devout Muslim and should any lay question to his lack of Muslimhood due to either his supposed self-proclaimed disassociation with the faith or because of his Sufi-centric spiritual and mystical beliefs, then they are not worthy of his ideas or words. This quatrain also foresees the element of the usurpation of his words by those who will follow and in how many will claim that certain words should be attributed to him, and how even now from his grave he would reject such claims. Whether we agree or not, Rumi is around us all the time. In the social media apps that we open up daily, in people's reading lists while attempting to self-improve. Regardless, if wrongly quoted or misrepresented, his quotes still offer much contemplation and solace. Comfort to people who might be struggling in dealing with loss and abandonment, and those feeling weak and helpless. So what can I say? Muslim or heretic, jurist or mystic, at the end of the day, Rumi makes people feel good. Or better yet, Rumi empathizes and understands those moments of the lowest of lows, recognizes his reader's strife, and ultimately helps them take those very small steps towards an upwards transcendence. <laughs>